uh, say hello to Dear Further, uh, historian, author, and uh, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good one. All right, people, are we, are we ready for a decade of centenaries? From the Oslo Proclamation to the Easter Rising, from the War of Independence to the Civil War, the next 10 years basically means we're going to be getting a crick in our neck from the amount of looking back at what happened. Um, but did our ancestors realise what was going on, what was coming down the line? Did the people who gathered in the houses and salons in West Kerry, North Tipperary, East Cork or South Wicklow in 1912 have any inkling of what was going to come down over the next decade? You know, Were those were there any signs that everything was going to change? I mean, for a moment, let's channel Michal and Murray Hertig, and everyone, close your eyes. Eyes. Go on, close your eyes. Close them. Imagine what Dermot Fowler's uh, grandfather, he was 19, wasn't he, 1912? He was aged 19 in 1912. Yeah, yeah, yeah 1912. Yeah. He wanted into Foxy John's. What are these people talking about in 1912? He was actually barred from Foxy John's. <laughs> right. what, do you, what do you think? Did they have any inkling what was coming down? You no, they didn't. I mean, Ireland 100 years ago, take Ireland 100 years ago, it was um, quite a safe, conservative, quiet place in many respects. Uh, people weren't talking revolution. Um, the biggest issue in our Irish society over the previous 30, 40 years had been land right. and land ownership and there was a land war fought um, at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century. That issue is being solved, you know. Uh, there's 13 million acres changes hands during that late 19th century, early 20th century period transferred to tenants, you know. So the idea of, okay, we have our own land now, uh, a British government that is keen on killing home rule with kindness by making all of these changes, material improvements, building houses, an old age pension introduced in um, 1908, that kind of thing. Uh, and the idea is that if you make a populace more materially comfortable, they'd be less likely to be politically radical. Uh, and that works to a large extent. You know, I mean, if you take, uh, we're often dealing with an elite when we talk about, you know, political change and political ideas. We concentrate on an awful lot of the... Uh, the well-known figures or the well-known political parties and there was obviously a very identifiable home rule movement uh, which a lot of people felt a sense of connection with uh, which is not necessarily the same as ownership of you mm. know so they weren't necessarily talking in those terms they were talking about land they were talking about tax they were talking about price of uh, you know they were talking about the weather the summer of 1912 was appalling there were floods all over the country there were bogs on the move there were crops that were destroyed all of these kind of things the everyday things that exercised them and then you have bubbling beneath the surface and sometimes coming over the surface, agitation. People who want to change. There's a generational tension. You know, there are younger people who are not satisfied with their political mm. class. Uh, only 700,000 people can vote in Ireland in 1912. So the, the electorate itself is, 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 is very, very small and is very, very wealthy. So, you know, what's coming down the tracks in, in terms of generational change and agitation? There are specific groups who want to begin to look at the idea of agitating for change, but they're very much a minority, and the groups that are involved are very small groups. Now, even what happens in the course of the, you know, the, 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 what's coming down the tracks in terms of people actually moving against the established order, often they move because they have a sense of despair that they have to do something dramatic because they can't bring a conservative people with them, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there's a sense sometimes that they are um, not getting the kind of mobilization they want, so they have to do sometimes fairly drastic things, you know? But there's all sorts of different strands of activity in that regard. I mean, there were groups of militant women, for example, who were demanding the vote. The suffragettes are a fascinating um, set to look at in Ireland 100 years ago. They began the, the process of the hunger strike, for example, which ironically was later um, denounced by Sinn Féin as being a kind of a womanly thing to do, you know, take your medicine and all that. Uh, the women started the, the hunger strike as a political weapon, and it was quite effective in some, mm. some respects. You have that, I talked about that generational change. There was the Irish Republican Brotherhood, you know, those devoted to secret oath-bound societies dedicated to a violent overthrow of British rule. They clear out the older 19th century IRB. There's a new generation of uh, hungry radicals who, again, want the IRB to actually mean what it says when it commits itself to uh, creating a republic. Mm. Again, a very small group, but very, very focused. Um, many of them, of course, became leading figures then in, in, in what becomes the revolution. But again, a very, very small group, shadowy in all sorts of ways, not representative. Uh, think about the elites of Irish society. Think about the college I'm in, University College Dublin. There were 700 students in UCD in 1912. They were home rulers. You know, they were... Seizing, sizing up what was coming down the tracks in terms of the leadership positions that they would have in a home rule Ireland. Very comfortable with the connection with the British Empire. George V, the king, comes in 1911 and gets a, a rapturous response. 
so, you know, the, the connection is very strong and it's very comfortable in all sorts of ways. So they're the two kind of, you know, the, the different strands that you have going on. And you couldn't say that Ireland in 1912 is talking revolution. There are those behind closed doors a lot of the time and some publicly agitating who are talking about new ideas. There are people who want to take advantage of new forms of media. You know, we talk an awful lot now about what's available these days. You have a, a literate mass audience in Ireland 100 years ago for the first time. Nine out of 10 people over the age of five can read. Now compare that to the 1860s when it was only 53, 54%. That's a huge change. People see opportunities to spread ideas through newspapers. And again, there's a whole plethora of small publications that are devoted to the idea of the rhetoric of change and agitating for various, um, you know, various new dispensations, you know? So all of that is going on. And then people are consumed with what people prioritize in their everyday lives, whether it's sport, you know, football is a big deal in this part of the world. You know, Kerry don't win the All Ireland in 1912, but they win it in 1913 and they win it in 1914. Yeah. Kilkenny were in the middle of a three in a row, three in a row, for the hurling. Um, you know, and people mobilise around sport. So, what do people do for social lives? Sport was a, an important thing. People met in houses, the court. People socialised often in in, in houses. Um, they were a very fit generation in many respects. They ate organic food. That we well, didn't call it. They didn't call it organic food back then. Um, and then you have one of the things I think is interesting about the whole decade of centenaries. Like there's a, there's a chance we'll all be worn out with the idea, as you say, of the navel gazing that will go on. But this is about other voices for the historian as well. It's not just about you know music. This is a very appropriate title because the historians are going to have to look for other voices to give new perspectives and new angles. And there's all sorts of new angles that are there. We have not had, by any means, a definitive history of, of that decade, of that period of revolution. And, like, for example, there's all sorts of alternative histories to be written. The history of the Irish Chancer, for example, <laughs> which, you know, when you think about one of the things that's going to really animate the decade of commemorations is the release of the last big piece of the archival jigsaw, which are the military service pension files, which sound very dry. But they are far from it. These were people who applied for pensions in the 20s and the 30s based on their experience during the War of Independence and Civil War. They had to get referees to vouch for their activities. There was very strict criteria. The vast majority of those who applied for pensions did not get them. The bar was set very high. And this is not just about you know, proving your service. It's also about status. People want to be recognized for the sacrifices they've made. And there's obviously a lot of people who were chancing their arm. Uh, in, in, like, how many people claim they were in the GPO in 1916, you know? Yeah. A hell of a lot more than the GPO would hold in 1916. <laughs> that kind of thing. But what you get in that is a fascinating social history and the legacy of the revolution. How are people in the 20s and the 30s? Like, if you got this pension, it made the difference. For a lot of people, it was the difference between surviving and not in a material sense. So it's important in that sense, but it's also about status and it's about recognition. Um, and then you have, even I mentioned the old age pension earlier on. Yeah. There were an awful lot of people claiming the pension who weren't entitled to it. You were entitled to a pension if you were over 70 years of age in 1912. And there was no registration of births in Ireland until 1865. And the British Exchequer discovers that 21% <laughs> of its pension budget is being spent in Ireland. And there's no way 21% of the pensioners in the United King Kingdom were living in Ireland. <laughs> so there's a whole history of the, the, the Chancellor to be written there. Yeah. So th there are all these kind of um, alternative histories, you know, and I suppose you do have, it's a very serious business, there's very complex ties and allegiances, you do have to have a sense of humour. I often quote Ding Dong, Denny O'Reilly and the Harry Bowsies in relation to the kind of songs that they would have penned about Ireland's fight for freedom, the crack we had the day we died for Ireland, uh, spit on the Brits. Yeah. Um, you do need sometimes to take a step backwards and, and, and look at how this has been mediated over the years and uh, sometimes people effectively taking the piss out of the, the navel-gazing and the, the sense of self-importance and the idea of, of, of Irish identity and what it meant at that stage, you know. There's room for that, you know, there's room for irreverence. Yeah. Uh, there's also room for the other voices who are the, the innocents caught in the crossfire. I'll give you one example of that. I came across a story recently about uh, a man who was a newspaper vendor in Dublin City. Um, in 1920, when the War of Independence is hotting up in Dublin, the Dublin Metropolitan Police are targeted by the IRA, and they kill one of them. And the assassin makes a run for it. And this innocent newspaper vendor is identified by somebody as the killer. And he wasn't. And he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. And he was a British Army veteran. He had served in the First World War. He gets released after the uh, ceasefire between the British Army and the IRA in July 1921. 
And then during the Civil War, he is killed accidentally while he is helping a wounded British soldier. Now, if you can just take that individual and his experiences, being caught in the crossfire, but all those complex ties and allegiances, here's somebody who is being identified as a rabid Republican, uh, but he was actually a British Army veteran. Uh, the two of them weren't necessarily incompatible, but this was an innocent man. Uh, those kind of experiences, there's an awful lot of stories like that. Uh, and there are people who will be looking for memorials, people to be remembered, the children who were killed in 1916, for example. There's no memorial to the children who were killed in the 1916 Rising. And then people take ownership at local level. What was the Civil War like in Kerry? Mm. How did it differ from Cork? How did it differ from Tipperary? People will come up with their own acts of commemoration, remember their own individuals. People have a very personal relationship with the Irish Revolution, whether it's through um, family ties or, or particular individuals. There's also great silences, particularly you know, around the, the, the Civil War and, uh, and that period, and there's still a rawness about how you deal with that in very, very small areas where terrible things were done by both sides. That's what Sean Lamas, how he summed it up. Both sides did terrible things and both sides knew it. So there's an awful lot of, of difficulty there. Another fascinating thing is, we do not know how many people were killed during the War of Independence or Civil War. You know the Lost Lives publication that came out as a part of the peace process? David McKittrick, yeah. you know, yeah. trying to document every single fatality as a result of the Troubles. We need the equivalent, the war dead of the, 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 the War of Independence and the Civil War. So even at that basic level, we often don't have the information, all of the information. So there'll be a huge emphasis on trying to discover that. And then all the new angles that are coming out. I have a student at the moment who's looking at the impact of the weather on the War of Independence. <laughs> and I already have the title for that thesis in my head, you know, yeah. Catching a Cold for Ireland. <laughs> now, when you think about all of the planned ambushes and exercises that were aborted because of the mist, can you imagine being down in this part of the country oh, very five minutes. and deciding you're going to, you know, execute an ambush on a particular day or a particular night and suddenly you can't see in front of your nose? Uh, you know, there's not an awful lot you can do, you know. So this, I, you know, we, th th the archive of Met Aaron is now available to researchers. So what impact did the weather have on the War of Independence? All of these kind of other voices, new angles, new perspectives. Yeah, so there's, there's yeah. great scope there for a much more rounded sense of, of an Irish revolution. And it's also about trying to find those other voices that get the experiences of ordinary people. And remember, most people do not get you know, involved at the level we're talking about in terms mm. of actually joining armies. or mm. you know, A lot of them are, 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 are obviously, they may be supportive and they may be a part of it in a wider sense. But you've got to get that idea of, of how a society is interacting with the revolutionaries and vice versa. Mm. There's a lot of parallels between what you were talking about at the very start. You, you were saying about the fact that the vast majority of people were kind of happy. You had these kind of like, I suppose, let's call them dissidents. You call them people, people who talk differently, people who want to change, who are agitating for change. There's a lot of parallels in number of ways there between what was happening then and what's happening now in ways. You kind of like we enjoyed some lines. The second thing that kind of came to mind was what you were saying there about the fact that people had no inkling of what was coming down. You know, that when we have this decade of, commemor of, of commemorations coming up that are going to be hijacked by every Tom, Dick and, you know, Michal Martin. Martin is out there you know you're going to, it, there's going to be a situation that we need to remember as well that at the time there was no sense of this going on that in many ways when we're looking back at these centenaries and we're, there'll be people applying certain I suppose lenses and certain focuses to it there'll be a lot of talk about the republic the, the, the people were looking for a kind of republic which in essence they weren't actually looking for it commemoration is always hijacked you know, various people have their own particular reasons for hijacking commemorations who are the true inheritors you know, who are the preservers of the legacy? Who are the keepers of the flame of 1916 or the Republic? And then people draw direct parallels. And they would say, right, I was asked, for example, to give a lecture down here two summers ago, is de Valera turning in his grave? You know, and this idea that because of, of what this country has gone through in the last couple of years, that, you know, Glasnevin at this stage is in such a state, you know, uh, <laughs> not only have they turned, they've, they've actually left in droves. <laughs> And, you know, people are saying, oh, we need to invoke the ideals and the ambitions of the founders of the state. And it's a complete simplistic reading of history because we assume then that all of those ambitions back 100 years ago were clear-cut and mm. noble, whereas often they were compromised from the very start. So you can't make that direct connection. Of course, you can talk about the questioning of the Republic and what it became and what it could become again. And you can invoke people and you can invoke rhetoric, but you often leave the awkward bits out, the contortions, you know, the compromises, the megalomania. Um, and I, I was describing, for example, the way Michael Collins was being presented by those who want to erect a statue for him 
in the grounds of Leinster House in time for the centenary of his death in 2022, which is a perfectly noble exercise. Yeah. But they started talking about the reason why Michael Collins is relevant to us now. They do this every year in Bail of Law. You know, they go out and say, well, if Michael Collins was here now, he'd do this. Uh, and they'd say he'd make common cause with the hard-pressed uh, homeowner. Uh, he'd be very annoyed about negative equity. <laughs> and I was making the point that this is kind of turning Michael Collins into an early 20th century Eddie Hobbs, you know? <laughs> And he was nothing of the sort. And that's not in any way to try and undermine him or his influence or his legacy. But don't make those kind of false connections. That's one of the great dangers. And that's a form of hijacking as well as, as, as a simplification. But then you have the politics of commemoration. Yeah. I remember talking to Pat Wallace of the National Museum and he was making the point at the time of the 75th anniversary of the Easter Rising that there was this, in 1991, there was a huge reluctance to commemorate it because of what was going on in Northern mm. Ireland. And somebody suggested to him that he should take the guns out of the National Museum because they were giving off the wrong signal. And he was making the point that, look, this is our history. This is, this is the way this state came into being. It had a bloody birth. The same is true of the state of Northern Ireland. You can't deny that just because of what is going on now. But you can see the sensitivities around it. Yeah. And one of the Fianna Gael ministers didn't turn up to the annual commemoration outside the GPO. He claimed that he had forgotten to um, set his clock, you know, uh, avoiding or, or, or trying to look for an opportunity to avo avoid what they thought was the embarrassment of it. So th it depends on the politics of it. Like, we've actually had already the centenary of the 1916 Rising. They just did it for the 90th anniversary. They brought the tanks yeah. back, you know, because yeah. they decided the political climate was conducive to this now. Um, and it was really about, about trying to pull the rug from under Sinn Féin because it was making inroads into Fianna Fáil support at that time, you know. So you have an element of that. Uh, and also, even with the, what happened to Fianna Fáil in the last general election, people were saying, oh, this is a bit like 1918 when Sinn Féin destroyed the Irish Parliamentary Party. Yes, it is in terms of the destruction of a once-all-powerful political movement. But it's not the same. Uh, it, it wasn't a revolution, you know. Uh, you know, in many respects, it was a changing of the guard, you know. So you can't always make those, those parallels. But people are always going to try and, and hijack it and pursue their own mm. particular agendas. Um, and it, it plays into that sense of commemoration being dangerous, you know, that we have to be very guarded. People will often say now uh, that commemoration needs to be an extension of the peace process in Northern Ireland or that arose out of, of, of the Troubles. And I would object very strongly to that because the role of historians is not to bolster any political process. And people will say commemorations... Um, we can't have any divisions now. We need, you know, we need to make sure that there's there's unity around commemoration. Mm. That's ridiculous. You know, commemorations should be divisive, in many respects, because they are about commemorating divides. Mm. So there's no point in trying to to take all the awkward bits out and, you know, sugar that message of of division and the you know think about the the way in which people a hundred years ago were were mobilizing and into 1913 and, and becoming armed the ulster volunteer force introducing the gun into the equation the irish volunteers following uh, you can't gloss over those differences now and say well you know we had more in common you know or you know we need to emphasize what we shared you know you yeah. can do that to a point yeah. particularly when it comes to social conditions and it's fascinating to look back now at uh, issues a hundred years ago around living conditions and bread and butter issues and of course there were many particularly working class communities in what became Northern Ireland that were experiencing the exact same problems as say the slums in Dublin you know the slums in Belfast and the slums in Dublin we had this sugar-coated uh, Titanic commemoration yeah. uh, which conveniently overlooked all the sectarianism in Harland and Wolf shipyard for example which employed 16,000 people a hundred years ago. So already we, we've seen how, uh, you know, th some of the narratives could play out by, by, by leaving out a lot of those, those issues. But that opportunity for hijacking is always there. And even mm. in 1798, a lot of people just decided to do their own thing. You know, there were all these grown men and women getting dressed up and taking out their pikes uh, to commemorate particular battles, you know, and, and more power to them, you know, yeah. and they're taking ownership of, of their past and their community's role in that past. Yeah. But what you would want is an appreciation of a younger generation for what it was about. Yeah. Not that they have to take sides, but that they'd have some understanding of the, of the texture of it or of the various kind of ties and allegiances that were relevant then, you yeah. know? Going back to the 1912 people who, who, who were in Foxy John's, you know, and the fact that uh, only a small number of them were probably, you know, l agitating for change. The, the radicalisation of Irish society, would you say it happened over those 10 years or was it still a case of kind of like a very large minority dictating what was going to happen? Well, people often ask, I mean, going go back to hijack of commem commemoration, people often say, but there was no mandate for 1916. Of course there was no mandate for the 1916 rising. Revolutionaries of the late 19th and the early 20th century 
did not look for mandates. You know, that they weren't part of their worldview. <laughs> Perhaps you could say the same of revolutionaries everywhere. Yeah. So when you talk about the radicalization of, of a people, um, there's too much ambiguity around it. Is the vote in 1918 when Sinn Féin wiped out the constitutional nationalists, is that a vote for a war of independence? What are people voting for in 1918? They're attracted to the idea of change and radicalization, and there's certainly been a change in public opinion, but are they actually you know, giving the, the go-ahead to a war of independence? And what actual say do they have in, in how that develops? Now, you could say you, you can't win or at least bring about a political process on the back of, of, of guerrilla warfare without some active support, or quite a lot of active support, from the ordinary populace, from the plain people of Ireland, in Flann O'Brien's phrase. You, yeah. know, you do need that. Uh, but the question is, you know, what are they authorising and what have they said yes to? See, revolutions will often decide that themselves. And it becomes very clear in 1922, for example, uh, when Sinn Féin splits over the treaty and when you have the, the beginnings of the Civil War period, that there are those who have been so consumed in revolution and in having a lot of power and getting things done their own way, they're not very mindful to listen. And they're, not, uh, they're attracted to this idea of devotion to the republic, however abstract that might be. Yeah. So they're not interested in arguments around stepping stones. And maybe we should take this now and compromise and see, can we build from this? They become very absolutist. They become very fundamentalist. Uh, and of course, you could be very dismissive now and say that you know, they didn't have any respect for majority opinion or they weren't Democrats. But how do you define democracy 100 years ago? Hmm. There's a very different understanding of democracy that we have now. So when you're trying to make direct parallels, uh, you know, go back to this question of, of, of who has a stake in the country. You know, even the, you know, the, the social origins of those who were involved or who mobilized, how radical were they? You know, were they radical in particular ways or were they radical all around? Mm. They weren't, you know, and the proof of that is there in what happens afterwards, which we've tried to explore uh, in all sorts of different ways. You know, that they become very comfortable soon after the revolution is over with dismissing some of its more radical elements and some of its more radical promises. I mean, how often is the phrase, phrases from the uh, 1916 proclamation, how often are they invoked? Yeah. The cherishing all the children of the nation equally. I mean, that's used ad nauseum mm. precisely because of the belief that it was never actually fulfilled. Mm. So obviously that radicalism uh, is, is, is perhaps not genuine. But is it genuine in every, any revolution? Mm. You know, but, I mean, how many revolutionaries actually followed through on the promises that they make? You know, yeah. there's compromises yeah. and contortions all over. L like, you know, let's go back to the kind of like me, supposed the East 16, the proclamation, you know, you know, they stand outside GPO in front of the millions of people who are fighting in GPO and they proclaim a republic. You know, this is, this is the, the great, the, 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 this is the kind of like, I suppose, the Magna Carta of Irish history, the, the Declaration of Republic. You know, did people actually know what a republic was all about, or was this kind of like something? It was like a kind of a a, a brand, uh, a, br a branding exercise in a way. We're going to get, make this a republic, and this was going to be. This is the hip yeah. word right branding, now. Branding, branding is actually the word because it was often referred to as the Sinn Fein Rebellion in 1916. It was nothing of the sort. Sinn Fein was not involved in organising the 1916 Rising. Yeah. It was the Irish Republican Brotherhood. There was uh, the Irish Volunteers. There was the Irish Citizens Army. There was not Sinn Fein. But Sinn Féin ironically benefited from brand recognition because suddenly after mm. 1916 when public opinion changes, Sinn Féin is suddenly on everybody's lips uh, in, you know, in, in a way that's very good for them and for their brand. And 1917 and 1918 is about branding Sinn Féin and mobilising young people around the idea. People who will vote for the first time because of changes in the representation of the People Act in 1918. So you have young people who can vote for the first time, but they can also mobilise, mobilise around uh, a new brand. But 1916, when the proclamation is being read out, not at all. People mm. hadn't thought about that. And if you have all the focus now that is devoted to the idea of a new republic or up the republic, you know, and people are talking about the evolution of republican thinking. No, people weren't, and that's not to say they weren't uh, clever people or they weren't thinking people. It's just that there wasn't that discussion or level of rhetoric amongst the general populace about you know, what a republic might mean. But even within the revolutionaries, yeah. Michael Collins admitted to an American journalist in the middle of the War of Independence that none of us have given very much thought to what this republic might be. And the mantra often was, we can work all that out once we have got rid of Britain. Yeah, you know, yeah. And the same was true of Labour. See how Labour is sidelined, and the Labour movement in many respects is sidelined. And the mantra was Labour must wait. We can't complicate the purity of our struggle with these bread and butter issues because they will detract from the main purpose and they'll detract from the branding. And again, you know, to sell your message, you have to have something that's very identifiable and very simplistic. And that means glossing over again an awful mm. lot uh, of the, the, the difficulties. And the voices of people who want to say, well, hang on, can we actually think about how this might work 
in practice. Mm. So yes, it, it's fair to say that there wasn't an awful lot of thought given to that. Yeah. So like, I mean, let, let, moving on to near to today, and I, I, d- like looking back now, kind of like wh- how this republic came into being, the, the, all the convoluted, I suppose, branding exercise around it. And you, you, you've mentioned once or twice there about like, I mean, the, the second republic and this, co- this call for a second republic, this need for a second republic. You know, do you think, I mean, the, that Irish people right now, and I know it's an unfair question to ask of a, of a historian, but just looking at the, at the Irish people right now, do we even understand what a republic is? Or do we understand what's missing from our republic? Or would it be a case if we asked people out here what's missing from the Irish republic, you'd get 80 different answers? You would, yeah. You can find the republic you find or you want. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's always been the case. People take different aspects. There are different theories of republicanism, different forms of a republic. Uh, but how do you actually define uh, one that people can identify with. Uh, what are you talking about? Are you talking about equality? Are you talking mm-hmm. about liberty? Are you talking about fraternity? Are you talking about f- uh, f- you know freedom in it? In what sense? You know, and who is free? And who 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 is who has ownership of this? There's no one answer to this, uh, and there never was. Uh, and we don't need to be dismissive or cynical. Uh, I think there's a huge danger in the f- in, in in commemoration. Uh, of looking back and being very dismissive of a generation that were very idealistic in a very noble way. Mm. That's not to say that they had worked out everything, but they often were not prepared to urge people to take risks and to make sacrifices that they themselves were not prepared to make. That's a very important point to make when you look at the sacrifices that people made. There's a great pride in the events of that period for a lot of people. That pride should not be bullied out of existence, and we shouldn't get to the point where we're saying, but, but sure, they didn't know what they were at. Yeah. They did in all sorts of ways. They were very focused and they were very effective and they were very clever in all sorts of ways. Think about what they were up against. Think about how early they rise. You know, think about what India, for example, learns from the Irish revolutionaries, which they can implement at a much later stage. So they were giving inspiration in terms of a, a, a big challenge against British imperialism at a time when the British Empire was extraordinarily powerful. So they were clever and motivated and idealistic. So we don't have to fault them for not defining a republic that we ourselves can't even define a hundred years later, you know? And I mean, yes, there are as many definitions there. I mean, isn't it interesting that we have uh, a whole industry now around the idea of, you know, even if it's the four angry men, um, about, you know, reclaiming the republic, up the republic, a new republic. There was a stage in Irish uh, publishing endeavours where you could have, you know, shelves devoted to the misery memoir, you know? This is the misery shelf, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and now we can have shelves devoted to the new republic, you know. And again, you'll get as many voices and as many uh, ideas or solutions within that, you know. Mm. I mean, l- l- let's let's talk about like I mean some of those, some of those voices, you know, particular voices it has a bit of resonance because we're down here in Kerry with, with other voices and with music and culture, you know. Like, but let's say a hundred years ago, what what place the, uh, the culture was playing? What did, did it have a large part? You think to play an important part, role to play in defining what that republic is going to be? Did the kind of like the cultural agitators of the day, the Philip Kings of nineteen twelve, did they have a big role to play in what was what that republic was going to be shaped like? They did because uh, to quote. Yeats at the time, Ireland was like wax as culturally, you know, it was plastic, it was waiting to be moulded. And there are, not, there are a babble of cultural voices and impulses that are trying to feed into that and, and, and trying to shape that mould. Uh, and again, they have different priorities. Um, there's, there's, for example, give me an example of a play that staged 100 years ago in the Abbey Theatre by Lennox Robinson. Um, and it's about an individual who is jailed for his Fenian activities. And he comes back after his imprisonment to his local community and there's a lot of sympathy for him, but there's no real interest in him reviving his ideas or there's no real appetite for the idea uh, that we need to mobilise a new kind of generation of Fenians. Yeah. Uh, Lennox Robinson was on to that at that time in 1912 in the same way that Yeats and others were about you know, trying to raise these difficult issues of how we deal with our history and how we might shape it for the present or reflect some of, the, some of those currents, you know. Um, so the Abbey was playing a role in that in, 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 in a cultural sense. Um, music, language is very, very important. You know, the, the, the Gaelic League uh, is, is a meeting ground for all sorts of different activists, for men and women. It was one of the few places where they could mix together quite freely uh, in ways that weren't open to them in other uh, avenues. Language is hugely important in terms of, of defining a generation. An awful lot of people came in to the political movements through the cultural movements and sometimes through the sporting movements. Um, and, you know, they are all, they're all, all of those influences are being brought to bear on that mm. generation. And again, it depends on the part of, of the country you are in and what is open to you or what's accessible to you. Uh, and that whole uh, idea of preserving Irish history and Irish memory. You know, think about people who would have been here uh, 100 years ago. 
there were still people there who had memories of the famine. Mm. There were still people who had memories of, of, of previous uh, battles uh, and previous revolutions. So, you know, they, that's a form, a very important form of cultural endeavour is the, the preservation of memory uh, and the transmitting to another generation of that sense of history yeah. and evolution and uh, you know the, the whole idea of evolving and the whole idea of, 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 of a new generation having to put their own particular interpretation so that's coming out in plays and it's coming out in discussions about language um, and in the kind of you know music that's being listened to um, so yes culturally there, there's an awful lot at play I think that that idea of, of the mold of trying to find a shape mm. is something that's there and it's it's quite porous you know, uh, but that's where you often get a lot, a lot of creativity mm. and a sense of possibility. Mm. When you look like I mean, the cultural landscape today, I mean, do you think you, a lot? Do you think a lot of practitioners are kind of actively looking at this, looking at that question and seeking it? Because I mean, you you've been raising a couple of uh, questions lately about the Second Republic, a couple of pieces you've written for the Irish Times, a bit around 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 a new book, and just ideas around the cultural institutions as well. Do you think it behoves cultural practitioners today to kind of like actually stand up and declare where they are on things? Of course, and now more than ever. And um, perhaps every generation will say that. Uh, but to me, it, it makes a complete mockery of any commitment to culture and preserving the past in commemoration uh, if the very institutions that are the custodians of all this yeah. history and all this material and are the public face in many respects uh, of, that, of that culture and of that heritage and of that archive, if they are being treated the way they are now, that makes a mockery of any idea of, of effectively commemorating the events of that period. Uh, and I mean, you've only got to think about what a national institution, cultural institution means. I mean, what does it mean? It means it belongs to all of us. You know, the National Library is the National Library because it belongs to all of us. It's a public space. It's a very important public space. So are the National Museum, so is the National Archives. So there's a huge, there's a huge pressure obviously financially on all of those institutions but it also behoves anyone who's involved in uh, and has an opportunity to raise these concerns to be very loud about it at the moment but no uh, one is i mean like it goes back to your quote about i mean is 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 president michael lee higgins the active the active opposition in this country right now well then the, i mean the, yeah the, the point about who is prepared to speak about not just the republic but about the cultural infrastructure around the republic and all of these various institutions um, and again, can we create the space for that? Because people will often turn around and say, well, hang on a sec, there are people waiting on trolleys. You know, there are people dying unnecessarily because of the uh, cutbacks and the funding. Can we think about that in that way and solely in that way? If we begin to do that, uh, we begin this uh, you know, process of identifying hierarchies. Um, and you know, we don't have, we can't afford culture. Can we ever actually afford to say that we can't afford culture? Mm. You know, there's a huge appetite in this country for, for history, for discussion, uh, for this kind of uh, forum. Uh, people are interested in talking about identity and where we are and what we should be uh, challenging ourselves with. Um, and I mean, that's, I suppose, if you look at, I think one of the reasons why Michael D. Higgins was elected, people often talk about the front line and, you know, uh, the dramatic things that happen in the, the dying moments of an election. Uh, I think there's all, th th there was another factor uh, which is that this is a time when we do actually need someone to be prioritising that space. Uh, and of course you can say, oh, well, sure, it's only rhetoric. And sure, Michael D is a great man for, um, you know, talking about ideas. And I think what's important about uh, maybe what he represents is this notion of, again, going back to your question about the Republic and identifying what it is. It's about these connections between the economy and society and culture that they're not separate entities, that we need to think about the interactions between them. And one of the reasons perhaps why we experienced the ex extent of the crisis that we did was because you know, we began to compartmentalize them or forget some of them, and that they have to be interconnected. Now, there needs to be a space in public life and in public discussion and in cultural discussion for that notion of connecting them and how we might do it and how we might learn um, about a more effective way to do it. So, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why there is um, there is a space and there is a respect mm. for the idea of interrogating the failures, but also being positive about what is still there. Yeah. You know? yeah. So if we accept now that 100 years on, again, uh, we're like wax, you know, uh, what do we want to mould? You know, there's no harm to, to think about it like that. Cool. That's great. Dear Ferdinand, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>